I put it in respiratory elixirs, which you have a recipe for, because it's really, it's like warming, first of all, you know, and it's like, it's mucolytic, like it dissolves the mucus and it's expectorant. So it just helps you cough all that uck out. So we've been using that a lot with the virus um, <laughs> that everybody knows. And it's just, it's amazing how it opens your chest up. Hello, and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I am so thrilled to bring you this conversation with Lisa Ganora. As you're about to find out, Lisa is delightfully energetic and is obviously thrilled to share her abundant wisdom. I was so thoroughly enjoying all that she had to say that I let the conversation meander longer than usual. As you listen to her many pearls of wisdom, I think you'll agree it was a good choice. For those of you who don't know Lisa, Lisa Ganora began studying herbal medicine in the early 80s. After practicing as a wise woman tradition community herbalist, wildcrafter, and medicine maker for a decade, Lisa returned to school at UNCA and graduated summa cum laude with multiple awards in biology and chemistry. After graduation, she focused on exploring herbal constituents, pharmacognosy, and phytochemistry in the context of Western clinical herbalism and vitalist therapeutics. In addition to founding and directing the Colorado School of Clinical Herbalism from 2012 to 2020 and managing Elderberry's Farm, a Rocky Mountain Herbal Education Center in Paonia, Colorado, Lisa has also served as adjunct professor of pharmacognosy at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine and has lectured and taught classes at numerous schools and conferences around the world. She is the author of Herbal Constituents in its second edition, a popular textbook on herbal phytochemistry for natural health practitioners, which is used by schools and universities worldwide. Lisa also teaches distance learning courses on herbal constituents and pharmacy and formulates botanical and CBD products for the dietary supplements industry. Welcome, Lisa. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Me too. Well, I want to hear how you got started on this plant path of yours and basically, you know, what, what all has brought you to us today? Oh my goodness. Started on the plant path. So, you know, my, you know, not that my dad was an herbalist, right. But uh, my dad was from the Ozarks and that was the first time I heard anything about, oh, you can use a wild plant was he was like, Hey, you want to go dig some sassafras roots, you know? And I was like, sassafras roots, that sounds cool. Mm -hmm. Um, So there was like this little tiny, you know, survival of the old time knowledge going back Mm -hmm. to my family. And I was just super attracted to that. You know, when I was a kid, I used to, I don't know, play, play, I don't know what I played, <laughs> but I used to play in the woods a lot and mess around with plants and I didn't know what I was doing. But, um, you know, then I kind of uh, got into the conventional world and went off to college and nobody talked about any of this stuff at all. And there's this big gap, you know, and then um, I actually, actually, who got me, you know, <laughs> eternal gratitude to the cacao tree (laughs) Mm. who got me into and the dandelion root by the way um was I was doing the starving artist thing in Provincetown Massachusetts trying to figure my life out you know in my early 20s and my this and my that and I kind of got myself addicted to Belgian baking chocolate (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, I would go and get a big old chunk of it. You know how they had those little uh, these bars and, and I ate the whole thing and I'd be like, Whee, this is great. I'm awesome. Let's create a bunch of stuff. I feel good. You know? And then two hours later, it was the crash, the crash mm-hmm. off of, and you know, there was sugar in there, of course, as well. And, and then I would crash and I'd be like, my life sucks. I don't even know. Depressed, depressed, you know? 
And um, it took not being educated about health at all. It took me a while to notice that pattern, mm-hmm. right? That like, you know, reactive hypoglycemia, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and after a while, it's like, hey, when I eat all that chocolate, I feel like crap, you know, two hours later. And maybe I shouldn't do that. So I tried to stop on purpose and I couldn't stop doing it. No matter what I tried, I just go do it over and over again, you know, and I'm like, why can't I stop doing this? And, oh, maybe I'm addicted to it. Maybe I'm addicted to it. You know, like, you know, of all the things to get addicted to, minor on the scale, but still it was like, I couldn't quit. And so I talked to a friend of mine who was recovering from alcohol addiction. And she's like, you should try dandelion root. And I'm like, you mean the weed? Like what? <laughs> you know, it was like the first time anybody as an adult, anybody had ever said anything like that to me. Um, so I thought it was super weird, you know, but I yeah. was like, well, you know, I like to try things though. I do an experiment. So I I did. I went and I bought some at the little old health food store that was totally scared to go in there, you know, because I don't know what I thought that was going to happen. Um, but I went in, I got some dandelion root. And she said, you know, brew it, brew it up. And then when you want to go get your chocolate, drink a cup of this instead. And then just don't, don't battle yourself. Just do what you got to do. Right. So I was like, okay, you know, so I drank it. I went and got the chocolate. I ate half of the bar instead of the whole bar. And as soon when I got to half, my body was like, you don't want this. And I was like, oh, cool. And then the next time it was a little less and the next time it was a little less and a little less. And finally I wanted the dandelion root and I didn't want the chocolate bar. Hmm. And I, it, and it wasn't like me doing it on purpose. It was just like, my body was like, this is, this is what we want. And I was like, wait a minute, that actually worked. <laughs> that actually worked, you know, <laughs> what is this? This isn't supposed to be a real thing. This herbal medicine, that's supposed to be like superstition, right? This is 1985, I think, mm-hmm. or six, maybe. Um, and, but, you know, when something works, it works, it's obvious. And I'm like, e- okay, I need to know more about this. And I was super intrigued and fascinated, you know, and so um, I just, you know, started like finding whatever. If you were like, you know, two or herb, three herb books or something like that, mm-hmm. I, you know, it was it was before the the herbal renaissance, really, r- right at the beginning. And and so, you know, I just started following people around and like reading everything I could and meet trying to meet herbalists, and it, and it just went on from there because. You know, I, it, it's an it's a it's an endless fascination, really. You know, because you learn one thing about herbs, and you're like, wow! And you try it, and it works. So you make something, and then it's like, what next? What next? And <laughs> you know, there's this huge like number of plants, and um, I kind of you know, I I just really got into it. I started hanging out with traditional midwives in Massachusetts and learning a bunch of stuff from them, <laughs> and. Um, Yeah. And that went on and on. And then I moved to the Southern Appalachians about 10 years later and still a bit of an herbal tradition alive there and quite a few herb teachers and, you know, kind of got into that world, learning the Appalachian plants, medicine making, wild crafting, um, started mead making, started making herbal medicinal mead, which is really fun. And You know, at the same time, I was kind of reviving my old interest in chemistry. So, because I in high school was a chemistry nerd, you know, I was Mm -hmm. one of those kids (laughs) like sneak into the lab at night and do experiments and stuff. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So, you know, I thought, you know what? These worlds can come together because plants are making phytochemicals. Like, that's what they do. Like, phytochemicals aren't something like somebody invented in a laboratory. It's like this something that a plant has created, you know? And um, so I was like, I think I'll study that and see how I can bring that together with just being kind of a hands-on practical herbalist, you know? Um, So I went back to college at UNCA in Asheville and made everything. And I was definitely the weirdo at the school too. It was great. (laughs) Like there probably was more than one, but I was, I was a weirdo in the science department because I was like, what about herbs? What about herbs? You know? And, and at that point, they were, you know, um, okay, well, um, phytochemicals, you know, so, but I did a bunch of, bunch of chemistry and and made, made it all about medicinal plants, however I could. Hmm. So yeah, that's how I kind of came together with that. 
And uh, they actually have a medicinal plant research center there now. Ding. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Finally, you know, <laughs> a decade after I left. Um, but, you know, it, it, that was really fun for me because I got to indulge my scientific side and my, my nerdiness, you know, along with just this really hands-on deep relationship with medicinal herbs and practical herbalism. So short story. Long story short. <laughs> That's a fantastic story. I, I don't think I've ever heard, you know, chocolate addiction being the the, the gateway to being an herbalist. So I love it. Isn't it? Isn't it wild? And that and the dandelion root. And I mean, yeah. such a simple herb. Like, you know, it's like the most familiar herb ever. And, mm-hmm. you know, everybody knows dandelions, you know, mm-hmm. but it has so much power for me and and I was just like well if a dandelion can do that what can all these other herbs do you know yeah truly so, a gateway yeah. herb in that sense I love too that you had the situation where this person recommended it and you're like uh I was super <laughs> skeptical yeah and then you then you became that person <laughs> and, you know studying and, yeah people's yeah, turn yeah, I'm one of those <laughs> So yeah, dandelions. They're still, I still, you know, they're still amongst my most favorite herbs because there's just so many different things. It's like, you know, when you're first learning herbalism, you learn like this herb is good for this, you know, and with dandelion, it's basically good for everything in some mm-hmm. way. You know what I mean? It's got like this, so many different actions and virtues and, and, and different things that it can do that I don't know. I have a yard full of dandelions now. It just makes me so happy. I was <laughs> going to say, that. and they're so plentiful, so they're so accessible, which is something I love about the plant that you chose to share about today, Grindelia. I'm so excited that we're going to talk about this. It's a plant that I honestly don't turn to a lot for medicine just because yeah. I don't, but it's uh-huh. a plant that I love finding. Oh, like whenever yeah. I find it out, there's just those flowers and then the buds and the gumminess. Like I've spent mm-hmm. a lot of time just hanging out with Grindelia because mm-hmm. I think it, you know, it's such a cool plant. The, the aroma is amazing too. Is. Like even, even when they're dead in the winter, like, you know, it, right now it's, they're dried out. You can crush one of them up and it's like, oh, mm-hmm. it's like, it's still there. It's like, it's mm-hmm. got so much essence, you know, that it. It, yeah, I love, it. you know, I didn't learn that plant until I moved to Colorado, right? Hmm. Because maybe it was in North Carolina. It's pretty widely distributed. I mean, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it in the Pacific Northwest, you know, mm-hmm. where it rains like ever so much. And, um, but I didn't know it when I was in North Carolina and I didn't know it in New England either. But I came out here and it is everywhere, Hmm. like on the front range where Denver and Boulder is. And even over here, we're on the Western Slope, everywhere, super abundant, right? Which is delightful because that's kind of herb you want to harvest, you know, the Mm -hmm. one that there's lots and lots of. Um, But yeah, that's a spectacular herb, actually. I've done, it's it's one of those that... um, I put it in respiratory elixirs, which you have a recipe for, because it's really, it's like warming, first of all, you know, and it's like, it's mucolytic, like it dissolves the mucus and it's expectorant. So it just helps you cough all the uck out, you know? So we've been using that a lot with the virus um, (laughs) that everybody knows. Um, And it's just, it's amazing how it opens your chest up. You know, and I think there's some really good products made with it on the market now, too. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's got this like warming, like clearing sort of aromatic character to it. And that's that's, you know, how I've really become familiar with it a lot over the past couple of years that way. And it's sort of what I like to do with it, actually, is I like to use it instead of Osha. Because you know how Osha is like has a really similar character. I mean, it's different because Osha is like Apiaceae family. It's like, uh, you know, the parsley family or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the um, Grindelia is an Asteraceae. So they have like really different sort of base characters to them. But both of them are really warming. They're really aromatic. They're really penetrating. Right. And they're really just like opening when you have congestion and tightness in your chest and stuff. And um, but the cool thing is Grindelia is super abundant. Right. Mm -hmm. And it just grows. You know, they call it gum weed. (laughs) Probably one reason because it's so abundant. Whereas Osha is not that abundant at all. It's like not exactly, you know, uh, 
technically endangered, but I don't personally harvest it because it's it's a huge sacred medicine for multiple different uh, indigenous peoples and for bears, right? Mm-hmm. And it's it's just such a powerful entity. We get, I sit with it. I'll nibble the leaf. I eat the leaves and stuff, but mm-hmm. I never dig grandelia. And I just feel like, you know, it's almost like botanical appropriation for me to dig grandelia. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, to dig mm-hmm. osha. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a really cool thing about grandelia is it's an excellent substitute for osha. And I feel like, you know, the osha, osha, osha is like some kind of spiritual being to me. I mean, that's a powerful plant, mm-hmm. you know, and I just go up and there's a lot of it that grows up in the aspen forest up around here, like a little up higher. It's it's pretty abundant up there, but I don't I don't dig it. I just feel like mm, no, no, mm-hmm. not for me. <laughs> yeah, so, I feel the same way. We it grows up here in the Alpine as well, and wow. it's Where such a you? sensitive ecosystem. I'm in uh, North Central Washington, oh, okay. uh, right in like yeah. the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. Also dry, oh. you know, kind of a, not as high as you, but kind of considered okay. high deserts and. Um, yeah, so we can go up, you know, and find it. But I'm with you. I like to sit with it and enjoy it. But um, I use Ella Campaign. Like when See, the- me too, the- right? The- yeah. yeah, yeah. Ella Campaign and Grandelia have a lot in common, actually. Mm-hmm. And, and I use, I've used both of those. Sometimes I mix them together, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, because, yeah, because Ella Campaign is this, like, big, robust asteracee, you know, it's just like, oh. <laughs> I have a whole box of like gorgeous Ella campaign roots and I walk in right now. <laughs> We're just like waiting for anyway. So, but yeah, you can do, you can, they're basically as far as, you know, as far as respiratory stuff, I think there's substitutes for each other. Mm-hmm. So you could use Ella campaign or you could use Gondelia instead of um, digging Osha. And, you know, Osha just got, it, it started to really disturb me because it got way too much attention, even by people who weren't like, you know, really herbalist. They're like, oh, we can go dig some Osha roots and sell them at the farmer's market. And, you know, and I was just like, oh, too much, too much digging, too much digging going on. Mm -hmm. So, but Grandelia is really interesting because not only that, it's like that sticky stuff, you know, it's, was it called, they call it, it's not really, you know, technically a gum because a gum is like, like acacia gum or like, I don't know, gum tragacanth or whatever. A gum is a water soluble substance that comes out of certain plants, but it's, it's actually the stuff that comes out of grandelia is very sticky, very, it's mm-hmm. like diterpy. It's like a terpenoid resinous goo almost. And it's mixed in with some other constituents and monoterpenes, which are like the real aromatic essential oil ones that you smell. So technically not a gum, but you can see why they named it a gum because it's mm-hmm. sticky, right? It's like, mm-hmm. it's super sticky. Like if you're harvesting grandelia, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, can I, can I, pull my fingers apart, you know, (laughs) Um, you take a little, like some alcohol wipes or something with you to get it off, you know, Um, but it's got, it's got that sticky stuff that it it oozes out of the flower buds, right? Yeah. Do you know why that is, like in terms of the plant's benefit? Like, is that... (sighs) Man. I've wondered that for so long, because it's not like it's true, it doesn't, it doesn't eat insects, right? It's not that kind of plant. As far as I know, as far as we know, yeah, but it it obviously like it must be some kind of protective or something. Something's going on. You know, they they have discovered a several more insect absorbing plants lately. So I wouldn't put it past it. Like you know, I haven't seen evidence for that, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, But yeah, I'm not really sure if it's a way to because like it blooms when it's hot outside, right? It's like Mm -hmm. a summer bloomer. Mm -hmm. Um, So you know, maybe that sticky gum is holding the aromatics in and Mm -hmm. like releasing them and like they're traveling through the air and doing something. I don't. I don't really know. I haven't ever, I haven't ever seen information on that, but it's such a dramatic, like, you know, exudate. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot of it. It really mm-hmm. gushes that stuff. Mm-hmm. So when I harvest, I, you know, I get the green flower buds when they're just shiny and covered in that white stuff. And then, um, 
I'll throw a little bit of, um, you know, one or one or more, a few, several yellow open flowers okay. in there in the tincture or whatever, just to like get the energy of them in there. But it's really that sticky goo, you mm-hmm. know, which actually has been studied quite a bit. They use it um, in Europe a lot more than Western herbalists are just kind of starting to pick up on it. And um, Michael Moore was teaching Grindelia way before I knew anything about it, but it's not that that well known, you know, mm-hmm. but um, I found multiple scientific papers from sort of like the Mediterranean, places around the Mediterranean and the Middle East and stuff. And so they've, they've looked into it quite a bit and it's got that sticky goo has um, antiseptic properties, like what a lot of people call antibiotic, they really mean antiseptic because antibiotic is a very per- particular sort of systemic effect that, you know, but antiseptic is more like contact antiseptic. So when you, when you take it, it, um, it, it, first of all, it encounters your lymphatic tissue, like in your throat, you know, when it's going down mm-hmm. and it has antiseptic activity there. Um, and then it also has some where it travels to your bloodstream. It has a little bit of an anti- antibiotic like character also. But when it when it encounters that lymphatic tissue, it it's really interesting that activates your immune system. Hmm. Right. Because you your lymphatic tissue in your throat actually samples of all the different molecules that are going down there, all the different phytochemicals and all the different bacteria and viruses and whatever. Your lymphatic tissue is always like checking in and then it's telling the rest of your immune system you know, what's, what's coming and and what you just got exposed to. And then you get this immune response stimulation and activation. So, you know, there's some of that stuff going on. It also, it's a, it's a smooth muscle relaxant. So the smooth muscle that we're talking about is the bronchial muscles, you know, because when you're, when your lungs are tight or even it's been used a lot in the past, actually for asthma, which makes sense when you think about what I'm saying right now, um, it can really like relax those breathing tubes and the muscles that can, you know, tighten them up or loosen them up. So it's um, a bronchodilator, smooth muscle relaxer. So that really helps. And you can, you can literally feel it with, you know, with Gondelia. It's almost like, you know, you take it and you just want to take a nice big breath and everything opens up more. So that's really nice. Antispasmodic, smooth muscle relaxer. It's really, it's really good if you have like kind of like a cough that just keeps going and going and you're like, just stop coughing already, you know, <laughs> and like spasmodic coughing. Um, so it has a lot, a lot of like really helpful features for respiratory infections um, and respiratory tightness, but it's also a digestive bitter, which mm. is really cool. Right. Have you ever used it that way? I have not, but that is one of my favorite ways to work with Ella campaign. See, <laughs> it has that that bitter. It's like that bitter pungent. Whenever the bitter pungent yeah. flavors go together, to me, it's like screaming digestive, digestive. Yeah, yeah. They're they're like buddies, you know. They're they're like they're they're you know, super similar in a lot of ways. And Grandelia is interesting because I you know I went on this crazy like Grandelia research tear one time because I wanted to learn more. Probably when I was writing the book again. Like what's because th- this is the one that I found a lot more information about uh, ten years later, yeah, one of the ones. Um, but it's used in a lot of traditional bitters formulas, as it turns out, from like you know old world bitters formulas. Um, and there's liqueurs that have grandelia in it, and I was just like, oh wow. So I was one of the things that I do is I do formulation and product development for different companies. So I was working on um, with this one company on uh, a pair of bitters formulas, and I was like, ooh, let's you know we did this whole organoleptics thing where organoleptics is where you you know you use your senses and smell and taste and everything to really like dial into the actions and the energetics of the herb and. And um, did this. so it was super fun because we had like, I don't know, we had about 30 different herbs that we were like, OK, let's really, you know, chart out all the organoleptics for the individual herbs. And then that helps us understand how to formulate um, something that makes a nice formula. Number one, that works and everything, but also that tastes really good. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, oh, man, I love herbs that are used in bitters formulas like Angelica. <sighs> get out of here. That's like a magical being, you know, because it's bitter, but it also has these beautiful aromatics going mm-hmm. on. 
And Grindelia is kind of like that, but it's more like deep earthy sort of, you know, mm-hmm. it's Angelica is angelic, like <laughs> it's perfectly named, right? It's like, ah! and Grindelia is more like, rah, 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 you know, <laughs> it's very rooty and earthy. Elegant pain, similar, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it has that bitter and then it has that beautiful aromatic thing too. So it was just really, really fun, like, you know, diving into the organoleptics of it. And the cool thing about it is, and a lot of people don't think about this, but when we talk about a plant as a digestive bitter, it's also a nerving relaxant, right? Yeah. Because bitter is like what signals your digestive system to get, you know, even like I'm salivating as I speak, right? All I have to do is talk about bitters. I'm like, excuse me. Uh, But but it it activates that digestive process, right? When you taste it or even when you just think of it. Um, and, And then, so that's part of the rest and digest function of the nervous system, right? Which is the nickname for the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system. So sympathetic, it's it's weird. It's like they named it wrong or something, but the sympathetic nervous system is like the fight or flight thing. Like you're stressed out or something scares you and the adrenaline starts going and the cortisol, the stress hormones, you know, and, you know, you're driving and you're like, ah, (laughs) you know, and so that's, that's the fight or flight, you know, sympathetic branch of the nervous system. But the, but the re- rest and digest, the relaxing branch of the nervous system is the parasympathetic. And that's what bitters activate. So, so the experiencing a bitter, not only does it get your whole digestive system like ready to accept and like deconstruct your food so you can absorb all your nutrients, but it calms your nervous system, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And so like a lot of other side of the coin kind of thing. It's like, all right, we're going into this mode. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's, that's why I, I'm just like crazy in love with bitters. Like I, I am know. too. I am very obsessed <laughs> with bitters myself. And that's when you mentioned Grandelli as a bitter, like in bitter formulas, like I think that is maybe what I've been waiting for to really dive into Grandelli because I spend a lot of time making bitter formulas and I'm excited. Oh, cool. Yeah. 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 It's fun to play with. I mean, you know, and it is that it is that resinous sticky stuff. So, you know, when you tincture it, you use like everybody's got their own little tweak on it. But I don't know, like 70, 75, 80 percent ethanol in your in your, you know, in your menstruum hydro ethanolic solvent system. In other words, <laughs> hydro for water. Um, yeah, I usually do it around 75 percent when I tincture it. But, you know, it's a range. You can wiggle around in there, but you kind of need more more ethanol to get that resinous goodies mm-hmm. out. But it tinctures up really nice. You can just, mm-hmm. you know, just like you'd make any other tincture uh, with a sticky factor taken into consideration. <laughs> yeah, speaking yeah. of making medicine with Grindelia, I want to hear about your Grindelia elixir because this seems like a really cool way to make medicine with Grindelia. Yeah. So I got into this elixir thing. Oh my gosh. Believe it or not, like this was had to be a good 10 plus years ago when somebody was like, can you make cannabis taste good? (laughs) And I was like, uh, that's an interesting question. This is the, the early days in Colorado. And, and so I went to the old pharmacist book and I'm like, how do you make uh, you know, a resinous, sticky substance that doesn't taste good? How, what did they do? And they had this whole art of creating elixirs, right? Um, so I read up on all that literature. And, you know, this is stuff from the 1800s, from the physiomedicalists, the eclectics mostly. Like there's a whole, a whole book. Was it John Uri Lloyd wrote this whole book called Elixirs, right? Oh, really? And I was like, wow, you know, because back in those days, they used a lot of challenging flavors, <laughs> you know, and alkaloids and some pretty intense plants, and they wanted to make it taste good. So they would either make a syrup, yeah, and they used sugar in those days, right? Because that was a different era, you know, and sugar was like exotic back then. Mm-hmm. Like it was hard to get, you know, it wasn't in everything like it is now. Um, so they would make syrups or they would basically make elixirs, which is a combination of tincture and syrup. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I looked at all that and I'm like, well, what if you would just kind of use honey instead of sugar 
And then I was like, okay, so tincture plus honey, that's a pretty good mix. You can get them to play together um, to some degree. But if you, if you, what, then I was like, well, what if, what if instead of just using honey, you actually infuse the herb into the honey and make an infused honey? Because I kind of got that idea from Paul Bergner, actually, um, in, in, a, in a little bit of a different format, because he would, was teaching back in the NAIMH days in Boulder, he was teaching how to make honey paste right, which is where you put powdered herbs into honey in a certain proportions, certain temperatures, a few things you do to get it right. And it's kind of like an Arabic style honey paste. And I was like, well, what if you actually infuse the herbs into the honey? Like, you know, like you would make an infused oil, like you would infuse your comfrey or your chickweed or plantain or whatever into oil, like olive oil or something. I'm like, can't you just do that with honey? So I started, started experimenting with it. And there's certain herbs that just like honey is kind of mysterious, you know, <laughs> as it's like people always ask me like, well, what's the science on extracting herbs with honey? And I'm like, I haven't found any. Um, <laughs> I just do it. And then I do my organoleptic test afterwards and, you know, see how it turned out. Um, but honey extracts certain herbs really, really well. And Gurdelia is one herb that just loves to like exude its constituents out into honey. Um, and, and it, you know, Gurdelia is like really like strong tasting, you know, if you just straight up make a, <laughs> I have to laugh because in some books it's like, well, people used to use it for chewing gum. And I'm like, I, uh, <laughs> somebody may have told you that, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> not pleasant. I, I tried it once and it was a bad idea. It was a bad idea. <laughs> right. Because, like, gummy. It just it totally, it's like to covers your teeth, your teeth. And it's like, it's, uh, it's almost like a slightly acrid, really hot, like super intense flavor, mm. super bitter. It's like, yeah, don't do that. You see that in a book? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> right. Oh my God. Um, not chewing gum, you know, but even when you tincture it, the flavor is really, it's a strong herb. Mm. I, this, that's one reason I love it too, because it's like, wow, you don't need very much of it to, to do the, do the job, you know? But it, when you infuse it, when you use the honey to actually extract it, then it, you pick up like almost like the more pleasant version of Grindelia, you know, mm -hmm. you still get a lot of the activity and the flavor, but it brings out like, it brings out the tastiness in, in the aromatics and the flavor. And honey is like just so soothing and warm, you know, and like you can use that honey, you can make Grindelia honey and you can use it in Oxymel. Or you can use it in elixir. Mm -hmm. right? um, so oxymel is like you do a thing with vinegar and you do a thing with honey. Do an extraction with vinegar and an extraction with honey and mix them together. Um, or, or you can, you know, you can do the tincture and the honey. So what I'll do, you can either make, you can make a single herb um, elixir so where you tincture the herb and then you honey extract the herb and then you mix them together you know, in the right proportions, which is in the recipe, it's all written down there. So you want to end up with 25% alcohol at the end to keep it for stability. So it doesn't, you know, turn, um, which ironically, one of the very few infused honeys I've had that ever grew mold was Grindelia. Oh, really? Huh? I know, which is so like unexpected. I don't even understand why that happened, mm. but so, but if you get that 25% alcohol in at the end, um, it, it, it's preserves it, mm -hmm. even though I keep mine in the fridge. Cause I keep everything in the fridge cause I'm a fridge freak <laughs> and then it'll stay good for like years, you know? But, um, so I do the tincture probably, I, I forget what percentage I wrote in the recipe. It might've been 75 cause that's what I usually do, you know, 75%. And, and then, I do the infused honey, which is basically like really easy, actually. It's not too hard to do that. It's just, um, you know, you put your, it's messy, super messy, <laughs> but you put your grandelia buds, you know, and uh, I like to use one of those big visions cookware. You know what I'm talking about? Those amber glass pots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, those things, man. I love those. Um, and you just put however many grandelia buds you have in there and just like, Basically, it's volume, so one to two, you know, one one part by volume of uh, Grindelia. So, like, if you have a cup of Grindelia buds, you're going to use two cups of honey. 
and just cover them, you know, and then <laughs> get ready for the sticky fun, you know, get some dedicated wooden spoon or something. And so you put it on low heat, like honey likes about 130, you know, it's kind of like the ideal temperature for infusing into honey. And you can use a thermometer if you want, or you can use the like, you know, I, I always, this is so cool. If you, um, I wish I had a vessel, I could kind of show you it, but if you hold on to the vessel, if you can hold on to it for like one, two, three, okay, it's hot, you know, about three seconds. Um, that's about 130. But if you go to touch it and you're like, oh, it's too hot, then that's too hot. <laughs> you know, so you can kind of guess 130 by if you could hold on to that glass pot or whatever for three seconds before it starts getting, you know, you, you have to let go. That's a very practical tip, Lisa. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know because you don't always have your like laboratory thermometer mm -hmm. there or whatever, right? Um, so 130 to 140 is really good infusion temperature for honey for most things. And with Grindelia, it, it, I, you know, five or six hours actually at that temperature seems to make a really good, it's almost like, did you ever have somebody, you know, you ask them, it's like, how do you cook that? How do you know when it's done? And they're like, well, when it smells like it's done, it's ready, <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, when you're first learning a recipe or something, but um, it does take on a particular aroma. It's interesting, like an infused honey will smell better and better and better and better up to a certain point. And then it'll start smelling like, oh, my honey is too hot. It's I've, I'm overcooking it. There's this I don't even know how to put it into words, but there's this particular aroma where you hit it where you're like, uh, I should stop now. But it's usually with Gondelia, it's usually about five or six hours. You don't let it get too hot. You have to tend it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where you can't just set it and run off and do things in the garden or whatever. Yeah, he'll regret it. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I've boiled. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> I've done that once or twice. Um, but you have to stir it a lot too. The more, you know, I usually, I try to, when I'm doing an infused honey, I try to set a timer, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, you know, to come back and stir if possible and just give it a stir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because you can scorch the bottom if you're not careful. Some people like to do it in a water bath so mm -hmm. that they don't scorch it, which is really, really reasonable. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just kind of, a little too lazy to set up the whole one. I don't know. <laughs> I like stirring things, you know, you put in your, you know, your attention and your energy into it. But after about five or six hours, you've got all the goodies out of those flower buds, those gondelia buds into that honey that you're going to get. Um, some people do cold honey infusions, but I'm I just going like to ask you about that. Yeah. I don't know, man. It takes so long. It's mm -hmm. like, the heat doesn't hurt it as long as you don't use the heat too high, mm -hmm. you know, because heat always like helps accelerate, you know, not always, but almost always helps accelerate extractions, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing when you're like making something. It's an extraction. You're like pulling the constituents out into the fluid, right? Um, so as long as you don't heat it, you know, above 100 and 130 is ideal. 140 is okay. Like that's the range. But a lot of people are like, oh, you can't heat honey. It'll kill the enzymes. And I'm like, well, it does. But in this case, you don't care. You don't need the honey enzymes. You're using the honey as an extraction fluid, mm -hmm. right? Where When you want enzymes in the honey is when you're using the topical wound healing. That's when you want the enzymes because some of those enzymes make actually make like hydrogen peroxide as part of their antiseptic action, mm -hmm. right? So it, you do like denature the enzymes, it's called technically, but it doesn't really matter. So it's okay to heat honey like that. And then some people are like, oh, well, heating honey makes it toxic, right? And I'm like, well, it depends on how hot you heat it and how long you do it for, actually. So, you know, there's there's always an it depends in early right. chemistry. It's like, and the exception is, and it depends, you know, because mm -hmm. um, plants are complex. Um, but if you if you keep it to that temperature range and that time range, it's what's this stuff called? I, I used to I used to have this word in my head. It just flew away right now. But there's a particular um, there's a particular chemical that is made when you overheat honey for too long. Mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely something, you know, it's not good for us. We don't want it. But doing doing the honey infusion like this, you don't get to that point where you really start making a significant amount of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's totally fine to do this. Yay. Mm -hmm. And it works really, really nice. The amount of time you do it with varies by plant, though. 
So mm-hmm. like say if you're doing this with elderberries, making an infused honey, it's only two to three hours and it's like super purple. And then if you go too long with it, the purple goes away. Hmm. Interesting. Don't ask me why. I don't know that one. <laughs> but yeah, I scared the crap out of myself doing that one time. It's like, I ruined it all. But I, I didn't actually ruin it. The weird part is, I know I'm digressing, but we made meat. <laughs> we made meat out of it. It turned amber. It lost all the purple. Oh, interesting. But then we made, we fermented it like alcoholic fermentation and it turned purple again in the bottle. Oh, interesting. I know that was cool. Um, but you know, juicy berries, a couple of hours, you know, but it takes a while to coax those gummy goodies out of, uh, or those resinous goodies out of the gum weed. So then we make the infused honey and strain it out and it gets really runny too. You know, it's not like it was before you infused it because I think a lot of that resinous goo just kind of melts into the honey as you're doing the infusion. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so it's a lot, it's a lot more fluid. It's a lot more liquidy than it is than, than just plain honey is, which is really, really interesting. So then I make that. And then I have Grandelia tincture that I made earlier, you know, which, um, that's another thing I like, I have some like tricks for making tinctures. Like I can make a really good tincture in like 15 minutes. I know you're not supposed to be able to do that, right? I, I learned that in a analytical laboratory in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. It involves blenders and Vitamixes and things and some math, but um, you can do that. So, you know, you make your tincture separately and then however you make it, then you strain it out and then you mix it with the honey, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, the, and, and how you end up with 25%, I think I put that in the recipe, mm-hmm. right? There's a little bit of mathing around that you have to do with that because you think honey is 0% alcohol, right? (laughs) So if you mix it with your tincture in equal amounts, equal amounts of tincture plus honey, it's going to be half the alcohol that you started with, right? Right. So if you start with 70, whatever half of 75 is, 37.50% alcohol, 37.5. But the cool thing with elixirs is you can mix and match, right? So you can use different tinctures and different honeys. Right. right? You can have like Grindelia honey with elderberry tincture. This is an example. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or vice versa or any number of them. Mm -hmm. Like if you, so, so a project that I did with one of my apprentices, this was super fun. um, This past May, I think was we decided we were going to make a respiratory elixir, right. With five different tinctures. (laughs) I don't remember what they all were right now, but I remember there are five different tinctures and I think two different infused honeys. So it's actually a a whole formula Mm -hmm. and we use five separate tinctures with five different alcohol percentages. And there's this kind of calculation that you can do, you know, it's it's like fun with math. There's a worksheet, you know, (laughs) so, so you can, you can actually figure out if I combine like, you know, this many mils of this tincture, that's 40% with this many mils of that tincture, that's 80% and blah, blah, blah. And you can figure it all out and know um, and tune it in so that you end up with enough alcohol in there to preserve it. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause that's your ultimate goal. You want to have, you know, some people say 20%, but I like to err on the side of the same way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 25%. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, you're pretty good there. Mm. So, you know, it's kind of like one of those advanced herbal pharmacy things that you can do. But it was such a fun project because we got to make all the different, um, you know, infused honeys. I think one of them we used was rowan berry mm. honey, which is really like rowan berry is mountain ash, mm. sorbus uh, americana or americana or something, I think. Rowan berries are super interesting. That's another one that I'm just like, are you kidding me? They're definitely a superfood, mm-hmm. right? And, and so you know, another abundant one as well. Yeah. I mean, a tree will just like, you know, yeah. a lot of places, these they're planted as ornamentals or street trees, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see it, get them wild too. But yeah, I'm crazy for rowan berries right now because it's kind of like when you think of vitamin C, like everybody's like, oh, I'm getting sick. I need vitamin C. 
it's like vitamin C and it's Rowan berries have vitamin C, but they have all these like synergistic companion molecules too, right? So they have like all these flavonoids, all these carotenoids and all these other like organic acids, and, like, like things that make your vitamin C work even better. Mm. You know, they're like nature's nature doesn't make vitamin C all by itself. Right. Like, you know, that's a human thing. We're like, Oh, let's, uh, let's synthesize it. Most of it's made from corn <laughs> surprise, <laughs> you know, put it in a pill, but you know, in nature plants, they always make like this huge number of like synergistic or related, um, you know, constituents together and they work better together. Like any study that's ever looked at that finds this effect, mm -hmm. you know, synergy is huge. So instead of just vitamin C, something like rowan berries, you know, or just give you that whole like, oh, immune system support and, and um, you know, anti-inflammatory action and all that stuff that you want vitamin C for. So I think we, we made, we made some row and we put some row and berry in that elixir. And I think, what else do we put in there? Probably some sage, um, like sagebrush, some kind of artemisia. So, cause we have out here, we have three artemisias that are pretty common and indigenous to the area. So I was kind of getting some local plant in there. I don't know. We might've put, I don't even remember. We might've put some elderberry, we might have put some uh, aronia berry. Mm. Have you heard of that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Oof. aronia berries. They're hot stuff. <laughs> yeah, they're like they're like elderberries, only more so. You know, they're kind of like elderberries' big grandmother or something. Um, so you know, we put all these different things there. I think there were maybe like maybe seven different ingredients in that elixir. So it's like, you know, you start out making a one herb elixir to kind of get used to how it works. And then you can start like turning your elixir into a formula. Um, it gets really fun. And, you know, that's the sense I'm getting like, the, talk about making like fun, potent herbal medicine. That's going to be so wonderful. Oh, yeah. the respiratory track. Yeah. And it's, it's so soothing too, because it's like when you mix, you know, alcohol is a hot substance, right? When you talk about energetics, like alcohol is super hot. You just squirt some Everclear into your mouth. You're like, ah, you're not like, oh, this is using you know? my lungs right now. Like, yeah. But it's very penetrating too, which, you know, is, is a great way to deliver like herbal herbal powers, you know, quickly. So the nice thing about it is the honey really modifies the fire of the alcohol. It like smooths it out and it cools it down. You know, it's like a corrigent is the old word for that, right? Something that modifies or balances the energetics of something else. And so it's really nice to mix a tincture with the honey because the, the honey modifies the fire of the tincture and the tincture makes the honey like more dispersing, more penetrating. And it's, it's a beautiful, I love elixirs. Like it's, it's almost like you're tempted to take a little too much of them because they taste so good. You know, you're like, give me another spoonful of that. You know, it's like, put it, put it on the ice cream, you know? So uh, you can actually mix them with bubbly water. You can make an elixir and, and mix it with fizzy, fizzy water with a spark, you know, carbonated water, whatever. And it's really, I mean, it's tasty. It's like, who needs cocktails, man? Just, just make your elixir and like pour that in your fizzy water and stick a lime slice on the glass there. You're good to go. <laughs> Well, it seems like Grindelia is a wonderful herb to for people who haven't made an elixir before, or even if you have, it's going to be a wonderful herb to play around with because, as you mentioned, it is so abundant and it is um, so it has so many gifts for us right now. So, yeah. for those of you who would like to download your free recipe of all of the explanations that Lisa shared with us, she's written it all up, and you can download that at the show notes when you visit herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Lisa. Absolutely. So you mentioned Grindelia obviously has so many gifts for the respiratory system. You mentioned it's also wonderful for digestion. Do you think those are two main ways that you work with it? Or are there something else you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what I've done with it. You know, every, every, the funny thing is, it's like, you know, man, I've done this for more than 30 years now, right? And like you, when you start out learning an herb, you learn like the most common uses of it, right? The most prominent things that it does, but there's always more. 
there's always other things it can do. And like Grandelia, you know, I'm sure there are other other ways people have used it. But those are the two that I actually have experience with and, you know, pretty much what I do with it. But I never, I never say anymore, oh, this is what it does, you know, and that's it. Because, you know, there's just, I'm continually surprised by new things herbs do with people. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll talk to some herbalist, they'll be like, oh, I do this with that. And I'm like, wait, you do what? (laughs) With that plant? How does that work? And then they tell you about it. And Mm -hmm. so I'm sure there's, there's other things it does too. I mean, oh, you know, one of the things I haven't used it this way, but it's in, you know, when people write up about it is they use it for urinary tract infections, mm-hmm. which makes sense too, when you think about its actions, yeah. right? Because like, I like to think, instead of thinking this herb is good for this condition, I like to think like, what actions does this herb have? And then what actions do you need with this condition, right? So if you have antiseptic activity, that's kind of like for, for UTI, for simple urinary tract infection or whatever, people like to use yarrow, right? Urinary tract antiseptic. They like to use um, uva ursi which is a urinary tract antiseptic, right? Mm-hmm. And Grindelia, you know, if it's an antiseptic for the respiratory system with mucous membranes, you know, you have mucous membranes in your urinary tract also. So it's working on the same kind of tissue. So it's a, it's like an antiseptic. And, you know, as it moves through your body, those can, some of those constituents are concentrated in the bladder, right? Because they're, the kidneys take them out of your blood and they send them off to be excreted. So it gets delivered to your bladder, basically. Um, right. <laughs> oh, the body is so clever. I love it. Yeah. Physiology. Oh my gosh. Don't get me started. Um, but the antiseptic properties that work in your lungs also work in the urinary tract, right? So some people will use it instead of yarrow or, you know, along with yarrow or instead of uva ursi or pipsesua or whatever, um, or, you know, berberine containing herbs like Oregon grape or hydras or um, what do they call hydrasis golden seal, you know, those bright yellow herbs, the berberine herbs. Mm-hmm. So it's got that same kind of like, you know, discourages bacterial growth and biofilms in the bladder and helps with the UTIs. And it's, it's a smooth muscle relaxant, right? So you don't get that, like, you know, when you, when you get a UTI, right. it's like, <laughs> oh God. And it's like, you get these like little teeny awful cramps in your in your pieces and parts down there and it burns and everything so um yeah I can see why it would be really helpful you know to use in, in a formula for a UTI as well although I haven't done that yet so I'm, I'm kind of hung up on my favorite UTI formula right the classic nettles yarrow <laughs> marshmallow root right. mercy, you know and yeah. rose hips you know it works great yeah so that's one thing i've heard people doing with it top three uses i'm sure there are others yeah aren't occurring to me a wonderful way to get started with getting to know grindelia yeah for sure well i'm very excited to talk about the recent release of your book second edition of herbal constituents so i feel like to introduce this book i'm gonna like maybe say something that you are the last person I should say this to, but phytochemical study of herbs is not my favorite. Yeah. Which is why your previous first edition and this edition is one of the most valuable books that I own. And I was telling you Lisa before we joined that my last book was just, you know, all marked up with all sorts of stuff because these things are things that come in through one ear and out the other for me. And yeah. so I need a reference. <laughs> I want to know this stuff. I read about it. Um, and as it's obvious, you're this heart-centered herbalist who loves the herbs and I loves do. the actions and loves the the beauty of them there, not just this, you know, kind of rote scientific approach. And that comes yeah. through. Which can be terribly boring. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's, it's an incredible <laughs> reference. It's an incredible <laughs> reference book. And yeah. it's like what you need to know it's, and it's in a way that I can understand it, which is something awesome. I really appreciate. Um, yeah. And this is, I mean, it's truly one of the books that gets off the shelf a lot because I need it as a right. reference book continuously. Well, my life's purpose has been fulfilled. <laughs> That's great. No, you know, I'm, I'm laughing because I had like the most boring organic chemistry teacher that a person could possibly have <laughs> when I was in college. It was just like, you know, like really fast. And you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fail organic chemistry. This is horrible. So I literally had to teach myself organic 
chemistry because hmm. it wasn't happening in the classroom. And I did it visually, you know, because I'm, I'm actually a visual thinker. You know, I'm not very abstract in my thinking. I'm visual. And one of, one of my jobs in college was actually to, um, to, I was a tutor for art students who were taking chemistry classes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to like develop all these ways of seeing, like and mm -hmm. imagining, like what's going on in the world of chemistry, you know? So it is kind of a, you know, an interesting approach that way. And before I went to college, I had been an herbalist, like kind of village herbalist, wildcrafter, et cetera, for, you know, so like a good 10 years, maybe more. Um, before I went back to study the chemistry again. So I had a good big picture context, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just like, oh, all these uh, chemicals are in medicinal plants and um, these studies say they can do this, but I actually knew how the plants worked, you know? Right. Um, so I had a way to interpret that kind of information that made sense in in the way herbalists would you know, use those things. Or, and so, you know, when I, when I got out of college, I was like, there are no good books for herbalists about this topic. You know, like uh, there, there are some books where people made a valiant, you know, <laughs> a try, <laughs> you know, and, and they were pretty good, but, but like, having that that dual perspective of being a hands-on practical herbalist and then being trained in chemistry i think it was you know bringing those two things together and i kept i, I was teaching classes on this subject you know by then and and people are like what book should i buy and i'm like i yeah because there were technical books about it you know for like right. pharmacognosy and medicinal plant chemistry and all this stuff but they were like PhD type stuff and the language. And you're like, nobody can understand that <laughs> unless you're trained in that world. And then there were a lot of really good herbalist books who were, you know, didn't quite see into it, you know, with the kind of depth you need to understand what's going on. So that's why I wrote that first edition of the book is like, let's take this information and like give it to herbalist in a way that is practical or that can be practical that can help you understand the plants better number one and number two help you help you understand how to make better medicine yeah right, with the yeah. plants because yeah. that's the really really useful thing about this if you know know something about the constituents that are in an herb and like how to extract them because it gets very specific you know mm -hmm. it's different for different constituents then you know it's like oh should I tincture this plant should I make a decoction of it should I extract it with glycerin like can I make it into an elixir like what do I actually do to get those activities you know because the actions of an herb and the energetics of an herb correlate with the phytochemicals right so right. When, when I look at phytochemicals or constituents in an herb I don't see like these abstract things. I see like literally, I think they're plant spirits <laughs> because phytochemicals are not objects. They're energy patterns, right? You know, when, when you get down into really down into the world of chemistry, it gets weird and cool and interesting. And it's a very vibrational world. And so to me, a molecule, I call it a pattern of energy in relationship. <laughs> because <laughs> like uh, phytochemicals have patterns they're patterns you know you can draw shapes of them you can be like oh hey, they're flavonoid you know um, they have a structure they have an architecture and those things are made of atoms and the atoms are having a relationship with each other and it's an energetic relationship and it's called bonding <laughs> right um, but it's all it's not an object it's mostly energy and different patterns of vibration and those are signals, right? Mm -hmm. patterns, patterns of energy or patterns of vibration are signals. That's what we're using right now to talk to everybody, right? This is signals. This is like the internet, <laughs> you know? Um, radio signals, television signals, you know? All that stuff is patterns, patterns of energy. Music is a, a pattern of energy, right? It's a vibration, sound waves vibration. And molecules are too. You know, it's just like you've taken that idea and going down into the tiny, tiny world with it. So patterns of energy are signals and signals carry information. Right. So herbal constituents are patterns of energy. Right. Or molecules that a plant has made and they have information. And when we take them into our bodies by like taking the tincture or drinking the elixir or whatever, 
information is delivered, you know, to our system, which is also made of molecules, which are patterns of energy, which are vibrational system, you know, and something, there's a response to the information that comes in, right? And, you know, if it's a healing herb, <laughs> like it's a healing phytochemical, the response is you shift some kind of physiological thing and you end up having like better health, right? But you could say the same thing if it's a toxic phytochemical, which, you know, plants make certain, some plants can kill you, you know? So some information patterns or some molecules, you know, they'll go, they could go into your system and be like, shut down, stop working. You know, those are poisons, poisonous plants, you know? So that's, you know, not the ones we ingest. But when I start looking at the constituents of the phytochemicals that way, as like information transfer, you know, mm -hmm. to adjust processes it starts making so much more sense because now it's like an activity thing. It's like the plant has actions, the body has a response, right? And it's energetics. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it really a relationship does. there. It's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the relationship between the plant and the person, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just, it's not just like this herb does this, right? It's like this herb does some version of this for most people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but for you, what is the particular relationship between you and this plant, you know, and if you have a particularly harmonious or like, you know, empowering or healing relationship with a certain plant, then that plant is your ally, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, certain plants, certain people really resonate with, you know what I mean? And, and this is an interesting thing because, you know, um, when I teach class at CSCH, we do this whole intro, like vitalist herbalism thing. And one of the things we do is plant provings, right? We call them provings. And it's like, you'll get 30, 30, 35 people in a room. And, you know, I'll put some tincture, you know, lobelia is a fun one to do. So it's very dramatic, <laughs> but you know, anything, any plant or an infusion we use or something and we pass it around and everybody gets some and everybody will get into a quiet, receptive, meditative state. And then we'll, ingest it and we'll taste it and we'll kind of like you know write down all of our impressions and we're like oh you know where is it on the temperature scale is it warming to cooling because it's a continuum right is it is it you know moist to dry continuum is it like there's this thing called diffusive to permanent it's old physiomedicalist language it's like is it immediate or does it take longer to develop and you know where does it go in your body how does it feel does it influence a particular area or structure more does it sink in or does it expand so there's all these you know all these um all these ways that we perceive that the, the energetics and the actions of the herb and if you do it with a group of you know a, a large group of people like multiple times a year for X years, you see how, what the, what the variety of response to that herb is. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's not always the same for everybody. You know, there's, you know, a core of people who get the like, you know, okay, this herb is usually experienced as warming and drying and diffusive and bitter or whatever. And it'll be like, most people get that, but there's always a significant number of other people who have different perceptions and experiences of the herb and they're having different responses to the herb, mm -hmm. right? Because their system, the vibration, you know, of their system is responding differently to the vibration of the herb, you know? So it's that individual relationship is huge in herbalism. And that I think that's something like people might miss in the beginning when they're first learning herbs. They're like, this herb does this, that herb does that, this herb does this. And then they try the herb and it doesn't do that. And they think something is wrong. Mm -hmm. right? When actually you're experiencing the individuality. Yeah. You know? And um, I think most of us have been sort of like educated to expect consistency, like in the... In, in the pharmaceutical world, like you take an aspirin, it makes your headache go away, you know, but it's not like that for everybody. That variability exists with all kinds of therapeutic agents, you know, mm -hmm. medications, pharmaceuticals, like a certain number of people will respond a certain way to a medication, but then there will be those other people who either have an adverse reaction or they're allergic to it, or it just doesn't work for them, or maybe they're super sensitive to it and they only need like half the dose or whatever, you know, and that's just biology i mean it's variable <laughs> you know so learning i'm your so glad you brought this up because this is something i've been reading about lately of um 
in the context I've been reading about how English can be a noun based oh, um, yes. viewpoint and how we, those of us who speak English as a first language tend to think of things as nouns mm -hmm. versus other languages and perspectives tends to see, see things in relationship and sees things as verbs where we see nouns. And in the book I was reading, it talked about how um, chemists and physicists are looking like Adam used to be, well, still is by a lot of people considered a noun, but just as you were talking about, which you also talk about in the introduction to your book, um, yeah. is that relationship and that bonding. And there's this activity there. And it's not this like yeah. noun, you know, stable thing, but it is this active relationship based. So I was hoping to yeah. bring that up in this conversation. I didn't yeah. know how and you just brought it up beautifully and well, there really you go. shared in a beautiful way. So thank you. <laughs> That's true, though, isn't it? Like English words, you know, it's like the, the language that we're using really kind of like can limit our perception and our understanding of things, too. And English is really good at ob objectifying, you know, and like dividing, like um, what was the word? Uh, oh, gosh, darn it. there's a word for that. It just skipped my head. But it's like um, it's very good at making fine distinctions like this and this and this and this and this, which is probably why it's like the lingua franca of science. Like, you know, scientists used to communicate in Latin until that got old fashioned and now it's English, you know, um, it's really good at certain things, but it isn't as good as that, that relationship activity beingness. Yeah. Sort of thing. Like I like to tell people this. I'm like, you know, when we talk about vitalism, you know, like what's vitalist herbalism, it's like, okay, how does this, what is this situation? What are the origins or how does this affect you or what's going on in the realms of spiritual, emotional, psychological, physical, environmental, community? Like those are just words, right? <laughs> those are words that divide a unity. Right. Like all of those things are all in there together happening simultaneously, right? Like energies, vibrations, chemicals, it's all, you can't really divide it in real life. We're just dividing it with language mm -hmm. so that we can look at it from all these different perspectives, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, when I look at an herb and I see phytochemistry and I see actions and I see energetics and I see the plant spirit, it's not separate from me anymore. It's mm -hmm. just different ways, different perspectives of looking at what this, this living intelligent entity, this beingness, you know, being Grindelia, that's actually a great title for something, being Grindelia. <laughs> oh, I should use that. Um, is it, it is it's like and 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 then the the separation between different beings kind of dissolves too right because you can look at it as a as a flow this is so interesting a flow of mol you can look at it as a molecular flow like you know what am i when you drink something anything it's like the molecules of it are flowing from the plant into you <laughs> right and then out of you into some other aspect of the environment right mm -hmm. and like breathing like plants and humans are doing you know plants breathe out oxygen and they breathe in carbon dioxide right humans breathe out carbon dioxide and we breathe in oxygen it's like if you look at that for a second you're like oh all the plants and all the mammal all the animals are just breathing together in this yin and this yang thing Right. It's like we can't breathe without plants and plants can't breathe without humans or other animals. You know, mm -hmm. so if you look at the way like constituents and molecules flow between beings, then it mm -hmm. gets really interesting. And then and then you think about the microbes. Right. right. Like the microbiome. Like what are we we're supposed to be like 90 percent bacteria? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like what am I again? <laughs> um, walking bacterial colony. Cool. <laughs> um, you know, but the flow of molecules between the plants and the air and all the soil organisms and the mycorrhiza, like plants have a microbiome, too. We, it's mm -hmm. not just a human thing like this symbiotic gut bacteria that we have. We're covered in bacteria, but they're everywhere. Right. And so same thing with plants and herbs. And they just flow. The molecules just flow between all these different life forms, 
you know, and you sit back and you look at that and you're like, oh, it's not like this organism, this organism, this organism, this organism, that organism is separate entities because we're not, if you look at it on that level, we're completely interwoven, completely interwoven web of life. Yeah. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> Very well said and something mm-hmm. it's like something we can say. And I know for me, it's something I have to keep revisiting over and over again because it's almost like I have to deconstruct any you know, object noun based separation that I grew up with to yeah. really appreciate this, this interactive relationship interdependence that's happening yeah. at all the time, whether I consciously recognize it or not. Yeah, we're definitely taught not that way, you know, we're taught in that separating way. And it just becomes kind of like a perceptual habit and a mental habit. Mm-hmm. Perceptual habits are fascinating, actually, you know, because like we're taught I grew up thinking, oh, a plant is an object, you know, it, mm-hmm. it was even an it, you know, we even called animals it back then, you know, mm-hmm. oh, there's your dog, it, blah, blah, blah. Now it's like, oh, he or she or blah, blah, blah. We recognize their, you know, beinghood. But a lot of people grew up, including myself, grew up with like plants are just things like they don't have a consciousness. They don't have an intelligence. Mm-hmm. They're just, you know, convenient things that we use for our life. And it's like, uh, that's a very limited way <laughs> to have a relationship with plants, you know? So, so looking, looking at things from this perspective, really like, I don't know, I think about this a lot because now, you know, at, out at Elderberry, so we have, I got four, four acres and we've got these big herb gardens, these big trees and like some fruit trees and all this cool, you know, these plant communities all around here. And we're right up against um, a riparian area. So we got this whole gorgeous, you know, swampy loveliness going on. And then over here, there's like juniper, pin, pinyon juniper and sagebrush hills. So it's kind of a lot of different plant communities come together right here, plus all of our cultivated stuff. And it's like, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like when you actually live in a place, you know, for years and you compost like all the food that you eat, you know, and all your composting goes back into the land, you're like, you're establishing your place in the whole microbial community that's there, Mm -hmm. right? And, and in that, you know, you're digging in the dirt and you're like wiping your dirty hand, like Mm -hmm. you're you're pulling up a nice carrot and munching on it and you're eating bits of the soil and Um, you really become a part of that environment on a very deep level. And like, when you think about this molecular flow, it's like, you know, in modern life, we tend to be much more removed from the land. You know, a lot of us live in a house or an apartment or a city or something. um, And you won't have this ongoing, you know, continued ongoing deep relationship with the, with the, (laughs) with the molecular ecology flow that's going on there. And, um, I've been here uh, almost six years now and it's the longest place, you know, it's, I've ever like really settled into one particular piece of land like that. And it's, it's just interesting to think about it. You know, you become so connected and, and kind of, it, it moves you away from that division lifestyle mm-hmm. that, you know, we've, we tend to experience it's really common in our country and it puts puts the human back into like the relationship with all the other organisms in a particular like the chickens the, uh, the chickens um, <laughs> <laughs> little monsters like <laughs> the chickens are hard on her gardens that's um but yeah the horse you know so we're composting our our local manure now and all the stuff um so I'm not sure it's the connection thing it's like yeah I think that's something people you know even if we don't know we're missing it we feel the emptiness and the absence of it Mm -hmm. you know what I mean I think that's like one of the underlying underlying like problems that our society has is we are radically uh, many of us and most of us are radically disconnected from a particular plot of earth Mm -hmm. you know and like finding a way to somehow reattach and reintegrate into that really complex interconnected system with all the microbes and plants and animals and insects and medicinal herbs and, you know, all of that. I think it's profoundly healing too. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely agree. I feel like that's like the the space of my life that really feels right now kind of the most alive and the most enriching is that experience yeah. of finding myself back back into this place. Yeah. 
And it's so funny this time of year too, because like it's under ice. <laughs> and <Yeah>. so we like <laughs> do a lot of like computer work and like connecting with people over the internet and stuff this time of year. And but yeah, you know, we've got the seed catalogs out already. <laughs> <laughs> <I do. laughs> the gorgeous seed catalogs, you know, all over the dining room table. We're starting to think about, oh, what should we plant this year? <laughs> that kind of thing. And yeah, this time of year, it's funny out here because, you know, the, the, the climate is super variable where we are. You know, it can be like freezing cold. It can be super hot. It can be totally dry. <laughs> it can be soggy. You know, it's like Colorado. It's like, what next? You know? <laughs> what do we have on the menu today, <laughs> Colorado? So it's, it's a really interesting environment. Like, some plants really like to grow here and some plants are like are you kidding me i don't <laughs> think so but what's super weird is i got pokeweed to grow here oh wow yeah like that's not supposed to happen <laughs> yeah. yeah what zone are you in do you know do you oh know? i keep forgetting uh, yeah. i don't know it's where it's about six 56, 5,800 feet, 5,600 feet, but it's, it's pretty, it's pretty gnarly here as far as like, yeah, you know, that would be like zone three or so. That'd be my guess. Yeah, it might be. It, it'll drop like 40 or 50 degree temperature change from day to night is not unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Um, it's exciting actually. I love it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, Rocky Mountains. <laughs> you know? But yeah, the pokeweed, that's one of my favorite herbs. That's a powerful plant. I wrote a thesis on that in college because like, oh, wow. it's everywhere in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. It's super abundant. And and I moved out here and I'm like, oh, we don't have pokeweed. And then I was like, maybe I could get it to grow. <laughs> so I, I tried for a while and failed. And then I finally figured out what it wanted. Um, and I've got some good ones now. I had more berries than I could oh. use last year. Wow. So, you know, never say what a plant can't do. That's my <laughs> motto. <laughs> oh, no, you can't grow that here. It can't do this. It can't do that. And you're just like, <laughs> yeah, they always surprise me. So. Well, as you're dreaming of next year, do you have projects you're working on, classes you're teaching? Always. Isn't that the beauty of herbalism that you like you never run out <laughs> of stuff to do, right? Like yeah. new things. Um, yeah, we just put together an online course, which I'm super excited about. That's oh. like, when are we supposed to? It's about two, three, two or three weeks out. We're going to release it. And it's called Make Better Medicine, Solubility and Extraction. Oh, <laughs> so cool. It's fun because like everybody, you know, like that's one of the funnest things about herbalism is like making stuff, you know, everybody mm -hmm. loves to make stuff. So there's a lot of herbalists who understand like, okay, I know how to make tinctures. I know how to make infused oils. You know, I can make a salve. I know how to make an infusion and decoction. So they kind of have the practical, you know, they, they get that and they, they have a lot of good recipes. And But what this is, is like kind of looking behind the curtain and seeing why you're doing that plant that way. It's like Grindelia. It's like, why do we use 75% ethanol to extract Grindelia? Why not 30? Why don't we just do it with glycerin? Why don't we like, why are we doing it that way? You know, what's actually happening? And so what that's about is solubility. Solubility is like, which constituents are you going to pull out of that herb with this fluid that you're using, right? And so we can use different fluids, like we use water, we use different percentages of alcohol in water, or ethanol in water, we can use glycerin, we can use honey as a fluid, vinegar, right, is another extraction fluid. Um, I'm sure you could come up with some other things, <laughs> like, um, but it's like, you know, why are we matching that menstruum or that extraction fluid or that solvent is the technical word for it? Why are we matching it to this herb? You know, what's going on there? Like, what is it taking out of this herb? You know, that's where understanding some stuff about constituents gets really handy. Mm -hmm. And like, what about time? Like, why do we do certain things for a certain amount of time? Uh, is it better to do it longer? Is it better to do it shorter? Does it matter? Or temperature? Right. So there's like all these things that influence your extractions and how good it's going to be and how concentrated it's going to be and therefore how effective it's going to be. Right. And are you getting the constituents you think you're getting? 
<laughs> All right. So temperature can be a big one too. Like there's, I like with the honey infusion, you know, 130 degrees, perfect. Too hot. You're starting to scorch your honey, making it a little like burnt sugar, not cool. Um, if it's not warm enough, it's not going to extract as thoroughly. Um, so there's things like agitation is the technical word for shaking something, right? You know, that is like, oh, should I shake that? Should I shake it a lot? If I shake it more, will it be done sooner? Like what's going on? What is actually happening when you're like, you know, you get your jar of tincture and you're like, boom, 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 boom. Um, or, or like, what if you, you know, what if you're tincturing something in a Vitamix or with a stick blender or something It's like, you know, really a lot of motion going on in there. Like, what is that? Why does it matter? What effect does it have? Um, stuff like surface area, like how finely should I chop this thing up? You know, does it, do I need to make itsy bitsy pieces? You know, really to, should I powder it? You know, like, should it be fresh? Should it be dried? So like all these things that are, um, behind the processes that you use in making a medicine, you can think, you can look at each process that you're doing, and then you can kind of look at what that actually represents and what's behind it and how that's affecting um, the efficiency of your extraction, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and it'll be different, different with every different herb, mm -hmm. right? Because like herbs are, you know, different species of herbs are just like, they have different, I call it the plant matrix, right? So the plant matrix is the actual like physical body of the plant, like the plant material. And if you, you think of something like a beautiful, oh my God, roses, I love roses. We have the most beautiful yellow rose patch. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you think of rose petals, like how silky and soft and delicate they are. And then you think of something like really tough, like, like an Ella campaign root, <laughs> you know, it's like the care, the physical character of those things are so different right? Mm -hmm. So it has a very different plant matrix, you know, the yeah. plant cell wall material, you know, like what the plant is actually built of, like, it's, it can be super, super different with different things, or like a rose hip is, you know, really, really, really different than a, a dandelion flower, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the effects of the plant matrix, right, on your extraction and what you're getting out of that plan. How do you kind of work with that too? So all of these factors, like, you know, your solvent, there's a, there's a molecular phenomenon called polarity, which I won't go into deeply here, but um, that's kind of like one of the main things that determines what solvent is going to pull what constituents out of a plant. Right. So polarity, temperature, time, pressure, agitation, surface area, plant matrix, like all this stuff. If you think it through, if you understand what it is um, in a you know, non mathematic way <laughs> and, and you think it through, then you can look at your medicine making process and be like, oh, what if I did this? Right. And it, it gives you like tools for intelligent experimentation, which is really fun. And you're like, oh, you know, you know, I learned to make this extract this herb with 30 percent. But if I extract it with 70 percent and maybe if I even heat it a little bit, I do it for this amount of time, then I'm going to get more of these constituents out. And and that's going to make it, you know, better at doing the thing I want it to do. And so you start thinking it instead, you know, it's like you start with a recipe and then you start kind of like, you know, digging underneath and seeing what makes that a good recipe. And then maybe even like dialing in some of those things to make it an even better recipe, mm -hmm. you know, so it gives you yeah. a lot of creativity tools for, yeah. for medicine making. So yeah, we made this That's whole be a phenomenal course, Lisa. I know. I'm so excited about yeah. it. And it was so much fun to make. We did all these crazy demos and we got, <laughs> bet, yeah. and, you know, but um, I, I try to, you know, cause a lot of this stuff, I don't know, man, the way they teach this stuff in college just makes it harder than it. It's just like, mm -hmm. I think they do this on purpose. They're like, you know, let's see who can do this, you know? <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it's really, it's, you, it can be very useful and very practical stuff. And that's kind of my mission is to like take that kind of stuff and be like, you know, leave, make it relevant and make it useful and make it important for herbalists so that, you know, because, you know, when you start making medicine, you know, at first, right, <laughs> you're like, oh, I made a pretty good tincture. And 10 years later, you've really got that dialed in and you make mm -hmm. a really good, doesn't take 10 years necessarily, but you know what I mean? As you apply your experience that's over okay. time 
you make something better and better and better and better and better. So this this course is kind of like a way to accelerate some of that, some of that to show you it's like, hey, you know, if you do it this way, you'll get, you know, a more awesome herbal medicine. So it's, yeah. I, I'm excited about it. Yeah, so be, that's yeah. one thing we're working on. And actually we're going to have, um, so that comes out pretty soon. And the, um, a lot of the stuff in it is kind of um, a more practical application of some of the stuff that's in the book. Like the book really goes into like what's behind the curtain with all this stuff. And this is more of a hands-on kind of interpretation of it. But then we're also doing in June, we're doing a workshop, um, an herbal pharmacy, make better medicine, an herbal pharmacy workshop at elderberries in Paonia. Oh, wonderful. So yeah. And we did this last year too, before we wrote the course. And it was super fun because we take like four days. I have this new herbal laboratory that's almost finished pandemic style, right? Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be finished in May. <laughs> We're close. Mm -hmm. um, but we have this beautiful maker space, you know, and it's just really fun to, you know, kind of study up on this stuff and then actually come and do it with a bunch of people and camp out and have a good old time uh, sampling the medicinal meads around the fire at night, mm -hmm. <laughs> <Lovely>. <laughs> such things. But yeah, you know, we, we, uh, we make instant tincture, we make instant fresh herb tincture and instant dried herb tincture. And oh, cool. we'll be making, um, Oxymel, like double infused fire cider, and we'll be making elixirs and I don't know what else, and just some more, you know, next level kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited about that. And um, yeah, that's the two big, two big things coming up in the herbal world. And I'm teaching at a bunch of conferences this year too. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not running an herb school anymore. So, you know, I don't have to be there doing the administration stuff all the time like I was. So, you know, going to do some more conferences, going to be at Midwest. I'm really excited about that one, Midwest mm -hmm. Women's Herbal, doing a bunch of online stuff. So, yeah, you know, I get, I get bored easily. So I do a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm training a Mustang right now. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, and, uh, I got myself a Mustang. She's such a sweet horse. But, man, mm. Wild horses, man. They're wild. Yeah. They are wild. Admirably so. Um, yeah. And getting ready for the garden season. I mean, that's huge. Because we're yeah. putting in a drip irrigation this year. To oh, deal with it too. Oh. Hotter, drier. Oh, you are? Oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah. We should compare notes. Yeah. yeah. I've never done this before. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I got advice from... From somebody who really does so okay. uh, hope that goes well so yeah, yeah we're you know trying to adapt to the hotter drier by getting our water systems dialed in yeah us too <laughs> yeah. yeah doing some product formulations and you know yeah. I don't know all the things <laughs> Well, Lisa, yeah. thank you so much for joining me and for such a entertaining and informative Yay. conversation. And thanks for so generously spending your time with us and all your wisdom. And Absolutely. I'm really You're so welcome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. I love, you know, I love talking to people about this stuff. I really do. I really like, couldn't tell. <laughs> 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 it's so exciting though it's like herbalist there's just something about herbalists like I just met somebody the other day on the phone some herbalist never met them before and we were just like nah, 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 for like a whole hour non-stop you know and it, it's just like you know tribe so yeah absolutely yeah. well I have had such a lovely time and I'd love to have you on again sometime so absolutely yeah, have you back <laughs> thank you yeah. so much thank you Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Lisa's Grindelia Elixir. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can also visit Lisa directly at herbalconstituents.com. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so that you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this lovely plant. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.